Adam White here with another episode of Office Hours, and today we're joined by Richie Lai, co-founder and CIO for Bitrix. Richie, it's nice to have you. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Of course. So, you know, you spent 10 years at Microsoft, another six years in Amazon, one year at Qualys in between then and decided to start your own thing. Why, why, why at that point did you feel like it was the right time to start your thing? And why and how has this last five years been for you? Well, you know, to be honest, we actually started Bitrix while we were, all had full-time jobs. Yeah. We just basically moonlighted. I mean, um, when Bitrix first started, my son was just born, so I'd be up all night anyway. So, <laughs> you know, Bill and I and Ryan, we would just be coding it. Um, we actually built Bitrix in 2013, and um, we didn't go full-time until about 2016. Yeah. And how is it uh, <laughs> changing diapers and, and writing uh, code? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, that, that was definitely a challenge. Yeah. But I mean, the last, you know, last you know, three, four years that we can full time has been fantastic. I mean, when we first, you know, in, started and decided that this was a full time gig, we were four employees, you know, driving the entire business at the time. Uh, since then, we've grown to over 100 plus uh, in the last, you know, two or three years. What's well, been the, some of the struggles with that growth? I know we talked about it externally, but, mm-hmm. you know, obviously growing at that type of rate, it probably comes with pros and cons. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we, we, we've had a brief discussion about this earlier. You know, every time you, you double a team size, it takes time for that team to gel. Um, I think the biggest challenge really is was uh, finding people with blockchain experience and crypto experience. Um, I like to to think of myself more as a technologist than as a you know crypto fan or anything like that. Yeah. So um, I've made my career building teams and uh, you know building organizations that that run projects like this. And you consider yourself a technologist, but now in the Bitcoin crypto space, why did you feel like that was the right move for you? Um, it was an interesting move. You know, yeah. it's like I, I my background is computer security. And when you look at you know computer security and, and you know, the crypto space, there's a lot of intersecting uh, you know, tenants there, right? There's you know, you know you got to trust things, you got to verify things. Um, I you know it was just a change for me, honestly. Um, I think between Bill Rami and I, we we saw sort of the idea and where the crypto space could take us, and we took that leap. And where is it taking you so far? <laughs> a lot of long hours. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Probably a little bit shorter now, though. Yeah, a little, little bit. I don't know how much shorter. Yeah, right. Um, you know, like blockchain is a really, really interesting technology, right? It's, it's it has the opportunity to disrupt a lot of different um, uh, ecosystems. You look at what it's done right now with just digital currency space. You know, they there's there's the stable coins that are you know being traded you know more than U.S. dollars. But outside of that, you see you know games being developed on on blockchains. You can see assets being moved on blockchains. Um, there are blockchains that are, you know, helping places with, you know, censorship. So um, the, you know, there's just a lot of opportunity there. Do you think blockchain, for the most part, gets a bad rap for being too complex for what it is? Right? It is. It's impacting all of these industries, but for the most part, I feel like many people who don't really understand it feel like it's like a whole nother like world. Yeah, I, and I think that the problem is like. People talk about blockchain and they want to try to understand all the nuances of it when people should be thinking about it as more of a platform, right? Like you don't understand how your bank transfers money between each other, right? It's you just know that there's money in the bank account, right? Exactly. Yeah. And you know, and that's that's a a problem that you know blockchain technology companies need to solve today. They need to be able to abstract the complexity of it so that you know you, know, you and I can trade something. Um, last year a company created a game called CryptoKitties. I've heard of it, but it was yep. on, on the Ethereum network, and it was pretty easy setup. You just loaded up MetaMask, and you know you could trade, you know, the Elon Musk cat card to somebody else, right? <laughs> yeah. With a button click. So that's the kind of abstraction we I think we need to get to before we get sort of mainstream adoption um, in, into the blockchain space. And some of the mainstream adoption is coming, or at least through sports, right? You've seen a lot of sports partnerships. The Sacramento Kings are known for one. Yep. Dallas Mavericks is a sports fan yourself. Touch on the like what it is that you kind of see blockchain and crypto doing for the sports industry, and kind of how you guys potentially are navigating that as well. Well, there's there's a lot of aspects of where blockchain fits in the sports. I mean, I think the Dolphins just recently said they were going to accept Bitcoin as payment yep. for for merchandise or tickets. Yep. Um, so I mean, cryptocurrencies can be used as a you know transfer of value in that space. Um, and there's really more innovative things that can happen too, right? Like um, one of the things I grew up with was baseball cards and trading cards and basketball cards. Um, I mean, there's there's companies out there looking on figuring out how do they go digitize the sports trading card arena, right? And then there's there's another aspect of sports betting. Yeah. I mean, that's a whole new ballgame. Um, 
unicorns are already doing esports betting. Uh, where is that leap where we get to you know professional sports betting of some type? And for you, what are you most excited about when it comes to sports? Like, where do you see you guys fitting in, or where do you see just like the broader blockchain space fitting in? Um, you know, we're like Bitrix is a, is a is a platform. Yeah. Our our job is to go foster innovation and help companies develop these technologies. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I I have great ideas where sports things could go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I personally use you know Bitcoin to bet on sports still. Yeah. But um, you know, I think there's companies out there that are looking at at the uh, exact sort of um, space you're talking about on how they can move blockchain there and, and add value. Yeah, you, you touched on Bitrix, but for those who don't know, give us the 10,000 foot overview of what it is that you guys are doing and, and hoping to accomplish in the space. Sure. Um, so Bitrix is a cryptocurrency exchange platform. Um, our, our goal here is help foster blockchain innovation. You know, whether you're trying to trade a, a some type of digital asset or whether you're trying to trade, you know, you know some kind of... Uh, Card. Card, yeah, yeah, virtual card, right? Yeah. Like we want to help facilitate that. We want to provide the environment where, you know, users can come together and exchange these assets in a safe and secure manner. And you said, you know, fostering innovation. What is the innovation right now? Or what is it that you guys are kind of watching, helping foster, or, or even looking to the future? Well, right now, um, there's been a real you know, explosion in different types of blockchains. For the first couple of years we are doing this, you had your main blockchains like Bitcoin, Ethereum, maybe NXT. But in the last year and a half, there have been an entire slew of sort of you know, blockchain 2.0 technologies um, that have improved on what Bitcoin and Ethereum has done uh, in the first couple of years. Yeah. And you talked about building teams and like the culture behind Bitrix and what it is that you guys have tried to implement. Just walk us through that process. I think it's an important thing, sports team, regardless, entrepreneur or anything mm-hmm. like that. It's the, the, the biggest and hardest thing, especially for someone like us, is getting the people right. Yeah. So, I mean, my background is, is in computer security. And, yeah. you know, one of the things we did when we when we looked at sort of the blockchain space in 2013 was we saw how immature it was, right? Like most of the exchanges that existed didn't have full APIs. Um, most of them didn't have proper security. I mean, Mt. Gox was hacked constantly, right? And then enterprise-grade software. I mean, that's kind of the bread and butter of a lot of our development team. So when it comes to building Bitrix, you know, we sort of had these sort of uh, tenants of it has to be secure, it has to be scalable, and it has to be enterprise ready. All right? If we can provide those things to blockchain, then blockchain has a chance to succeed. Yeah. And has it changed since all this has, has happened? Or, and where, where do you guys see it going now that you guys have been able to kind of over the last five years, I wouldn't say flex your muscles, but have the opportunity to kind of see that roadmap play out? Um, I, I, honestly, I think a, I think a lot of the work we did early pushed other companies to go follow our, our sort of follow our footsteps. I mean, we we're the first in, in a lot of the areas that um, that we developed. Um, that said, I think the the playing field has leveled a lot. I mean, there have been a lot of you know sort of um, pro enterprise type you know, organizations being developed. Um, they're not just sort of unknown anonymous companies throwing up websites and trying to take money. I mean. You have you know, your Gemini's, your Coinbase that are funded by you know, you know, big backers. Yeah. And you're talking about some of the tailwinds and some of the headwinds, right? We're talking about like what's what's going on, what's back and forth. Break down some of the, the tailwinds you see for blockchain and crypto. What's going to push that to the next level? Oh, well, right now we're seeing a, a, a kind of shift into more institution players. When we first started... I mean, the, the, our user base was 99% day traders, miners, and the like. In the last couple of years, a lot more corporate customers. Um, that's definitely a, a tailwind that's helping. You've also got sort of a lot of companies trying to push Bitcoin ETFs, right? Anything that's going to help, you know, your, your, your mom and pops type people get into the space is going to help with its adoption, what about the headwinds? Oh. What's what's holding you back? <laughs> Besides, probably oh. just about everything. <laughs> uh, the same things that are that that are needed for for uh, adoption is, are things that are holding us back, right? Like yeah. it has to be easier to use. It has to be understandable. It has to be um, safe and secure. Like the the beauty of of like cryptocurrencies, for example, is you own it, you control it, uh, you can do what you want with it. But the problem is, you can also lose it. Yeah. Right. So no one's going to give you a refund when that happens. And on top of that, you know, there's a lot of regulatory uncertainty in the United States when it comes to this. So, you know, for us, especially since we're always trying to stay as, 
you know, within, you know, within the swim lanes as possible when it comes to legal issues, it, it's hard for us to navigate sometimes, uh, given the, the fact that there's not a lot of rules around the space. Yeah, it's almost like you're you're trying to follow the rules and you're writing the rules at the same time. Exactly. I'm sure you probably guys have run into that, right? Um, and, and I guess too, going forward in in terms of like just what this this platform looks like, what Bitrix looks like, the future of blockchain and Bitcoin. What are you guys trying to like project out? You know, obviously it's changed a lot in the last five years. What are the next three years? The next five years? How do you guys kind of see this whole ecosystem evolving? Sure, Bitrix evolved. I mean, originally as a, as a just an exchange. Our idea was like. We're going to provide a place for people to, to just trade A and B, right? But since then, like, we've really developed into a platform, right? We currently have, I believe, 14 different exchange partners. So there's 14 exchanges out there that basically run, you know, using our APIs and our, our back end. Um, we also provide services that allow for, like, payment processing. You know, we're looking at doing gaming now on the blockchain. You know, sometime in the future, there's an opportunity to do security tokens on the, on the, on, on the blockchain. So... You know, Bitrix is, is basically a platform now that, you know, anyone who wants to get into blockchain can build on top of. What's gaming on the blockchain look like? Oh, I'm not sure I can talk about some of the games we have in development right now. <laughs> but um, what's what's what you can tell us uh, about gaming? Look I, like I can tell you, like, some of the games you've seen, like a couple of uh, was last year or two years ago, there's a really there's a blackjack game. Someone built a casino on Ethereum. Right. And, you know, one of the, I don't know if you're a gambler or not, but one of the things Only when I'm in Vegas, <laughs> <laughs> one of the things about gambling sites is you never know you can trust the operator. Right. Like, are they switching cards on top of me? So I, I'm losing. Right. But um, using the blockchain, someone built a blackjack game that would produce a result. And then you could take take a hash afterwards and look it up and it will prove to you that the next cards that were coming were the ones that came. So you can you, basically it's proving to you that they're not cheating and you know, money's on board. That's that's one example of a really great use of blockchain and on on the network. <laughs> is is there an esports component to this as well? I'm sure there is. There's a great company called Unicorn that uh, our, our good friend Raul runs, and uh, they do esports betting right now on on a lot of the you know popular shooters. They do Dota, they do PUBG. Um, they don't do Apex Legends yet, which is where I'm trying to jump on. <laughs> but uh, like yeah, the I mean that that entire ecosystem of being able to board, uh, bet on uh, esports is, is a really great. Um, sort of like stepping stone to the, to the next thing. Yeah. And I think the biggest thing, right, especially in the U.S. and as you know, as a sports fan, right, you have all of the conversation, all of the background going around with sports betting. How do you think that affects your business? I know we've touched on it a little bit. And, and what kind of are these leagues and teams already starting to reach out to you seeing like what is it that they can do? So I, I, well, I can definitely tell you that that some that esports teams have reached out to us just for sponsorship type scenarios. Yeah. Um Again, we're, we're talking about a space that I don't, no one has any regulatory certainty on. Um, I don't know what the, uh, what's the word we're looking for? I don't know what, what the sort of path to legality is in yeah. this space. Uh, but I think there's an opportunity there to go to help define that. Is it easier or harder to operate in a place where there's no legality? <laughs> it's harder. Yeah. Um, like, it's, you know, it's like NFL rules, right? If yeah. you know the rules, other than pass interference, you know, <laughs> if you know the rules, then you know how to follow them, right? Yeah. Um, right now, we're just trying to interpret rules and, and, and you know, play in the same lanes. And every company out there in the space that's trying to develop something new and be innovative is doing the exact same thing. Um, and you're seeing a lot of the SEC come down on a lot of companies on certain on certain things. And while some things are, you know, definitely more black than white, there's a lot in the gray space. What's the last five years been like for you personally, other than having to change diapers and code? Uh, a lot, time? a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, honestly, after Bitrix was built, um, it was a lot of just maintaining and, and learning the, all the new things. I mean. Um, uh, this is my analogy. When the internet first came out and like, you know, it became more public in the early 80s, you had to learn like two languages and like one technology, right? And you would know just about everything that existed. Today, there's there's like, you know, tens of thousands of languages, you know, who knows? Yeah. Um, I think blockchain is very much similar to this. I mean, you went from Bitcoin to Ethereum to NXT to you know, blah, blah, blah. And it's just, it's a constant learning uh, exercise for me and my organization right now. To, to keep up with, with innovation. Yeah. What do you think the biggest misconception is for, for blockchain and cryptocurrency? That it's only used for evil. <laughs> you know, Why is that? Well, you know, Bitcoin has got a bad name from like, uh, what's it called? Silk Road and, you know, other you know, child porn, uh, trafficking and terrorist organization funding, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I mean, statistics show it accounts for like 0.001% of what actually happens. And the U.S. dollar funds more drug deals and more, you know, bad things than, than crypto. Right. Um, unfortunately, that's just sort of the narrative that's been pushed. 
Yeah. You guys are doing, last I checked, over a billion dollars in daily trading volume. Would you ever imagine that when you first started all this? Uh, no. <laughs> no. Um, it, 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 trading volume goes up and down, and, and I'll, I know... We have a great engineering team. That's the only reason we've been able to scale and to keep up with sort of the, the demand that, that exists today. Yeah. So what's next in terms of just for you guys? We talked about what's next for the industry, but what's next for for you guys and in, in the evolution of, of the company? Building on a platform. I mean, you think about like, I like to think about AWS. You know, they started out very small with, with a couple of services. You know, everyone wanted to use, you know, virtual machines. Everyone wanted to use X, Y, and Z, right? So they built little small little microservices that people could go, you know, build their technology on top of. You know, we we've, we've built an exchange. We have that it's solid. We have enterprise wallets now. So you can build a company and use our wallet infrastructure and let us take care of the security of it. Right? We have the ability to process payments now through the same mechanisms. So it's all about providing more building pieces so that if you're a company that wants to build uh, you know, be involved in blockchain business, we're the go-to place for it. For you guys, and especially you personally, what's it been like the transition from, you know, massive organizations with probably lots of structure at uh, Amazon and Microsoft to organization and really an industry with no structure for the most part, right? Building it as you come. Yeah. I mean, the industry may be immature, but, you know, luckily uh, Bitrix has, has been built on solid foundations. Yeah. I mean, we actually recruited a lot of our, you know, ex Amazon, ex Microsoft people, and we've got a fantastic leadership team, yeah. um, you know, from a wide variety of, of places. Um, so, I, while I know we're still young and a mature organization, I like to think that we operate at a much more mature level. What was the biggest takeaway of working at a place like an Amazon and Microsoft? There's a lot of people who always, you know, Amazon is the, the you know, the darling, right? Well, yeah. What was it like working at a place like that where you guys saw the inner workings and the inside of what, you know, most people think is like the most innovative company in the world? You know, they're, they're incredible companies. I mean, I, I can tell you Microsoft has some of the best infrastructure in the world, um, not just in terms of how they run things, but like their HR department, their recruiting, just how everything's set up. It, it is run like a well-oiled machine. Uh, Amazon, slightly different things that you look at. I mean, the way that they do meetings, that, that they um, that they make decisions is fantastic. And we take a lot of those concepts from both those companies. And, you know, Bill actually spent a couple of years at BlackBerry, too. And yeah. We take all those, all those things we've learned. I mean, between the, the three of us, we've got like 50 plus years experience at Fortune 50 companies running large organizations. So um, we've tried to take those learnings and apply it to, to our business today. Yeah. What's your meeting strategy? My meeting strategy? <laughs> Not to have any. <laughs> I love it. I love it. There, if there's no, if it doesn't have food, it's not a meeting, right? Yeah. It should be an email, right? That's what, that's what I saw recently. What are you most excited about in terms of the business, the industry, sports teams in Seattle? Oh, I can I can go on hours about that. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> no, the industry. I mean, the industry is going places. You know, it's like um, Facebook Libra. I mean, it's it's a, it's a great thing. It's happening. I don't. I, I can't tell where it's going. You know, you're, you're seeing some of the big backers pull out, but. You know, when you have a company like Facebook pushing towards digital currencies, uh, it, it means something. I mean, there's a there's an adoption piece there that, that's really important. And it's going to help drive regulator, regulators to do something. They may not care if Bitrix does it, but if ba Facebook wants to release a stable coin of some type, they're paying attention at that point. Do you think it's, I wouldn't say, a negative that Facebook's join, join on because of the past and the history from a privacy standpoint? And there's mm -hmm. already kind of like an asterisk next to the, the company? Mm -hmm. There is and there is. I mean, yeah. like, they're going to have to solve their privacy problems inside and outside of crypto. I mean, that's not a that's not a, a crypto issue. It's a Facebook issue. Yeah. But having a company, a, a company the size of Facebook, uh, in the space and pushing it, I, I think is a is a great thing. And it makes your guys' life a little bit easier, just from an education standpoint. Absolutely. Right? I'm sure people have looked up what is Facebook Libra more mm -hmm. than other <laughs> more than other things, right? Just Definitely. because of, of Facebook and. What about uh, you born and raised in, uh, not born and raised, but live here in Seattle, right? Uh, big Seattle sports fan. Yes. What are you most excited about from a Seattle sports standpoint? Oh, man. The Sounders are playing tomorrow night. <laughs> excited about that. Like some of the sports. The NHL team. Yeah. That's where it's at. I mean, we'll have one, uh, was it next, next year? Year yeah, and a half from so. now? Yeah. So I'm super excited about that. The thing is, I'm not even a hockey fan, but yeah. I'm a sports fan. So yeah. having a sports team is great. I'd love to see the Sonics come back, though. <laughs> Maybe maybe you guys when you're when you're traded on Nasdaq can make that happen. Right? There you go. You, you guys can be the ownership groups. We can bring back. back. There you go. Talk to the guys who bring back the uh, the Seattle team. And is there going to be any Bitrix involvement with the Seattle team? You guys um, thinking about doing something there? We have we have things in work with uh, most of the Seattle organizations uh, in town. 
what is it that you guys are working on that you can share or like what is it that they're coming to that you want to work on uh, i'm looking at lorna but like sponsorships is, is one of them yeah. um that's that's the main one right now are you guys building out any products with them no 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 sponsorship sponsor, sponsorship opportunities and like promotions how would at least for you guys, how do you view sports from a sponsorship standpoint? What is that? What is that? And besides being like a sports fan, right? How do you guys view it as a vehicle for success for Bitrix, whether it's just an awareness play or an opportunity to build out, you know, more integrated partnerships? It's, it's an awareness play plus it's a community play. I mean, we're we're Seattle, we're a Seattle company, you know, we want to support the local organizations and communities here. So, I mean, it's a little bit of both of those things. Which one, if you had to choose, and you don't have to choose, but <laughs> is like... It presents the most exciting opportunity. Is it the Sounders? Is it the they or they each have their own kind of excitement to it? They have their own. They only. They only. They each have their own. I mean, yeah. Seahawks have a great reach. Yeah. Sounders, you can get. You're a bigger player in the space. Yeah. NHL is brand new. Like, who knows what happens there? So, so is it going to be a uh, Bitrix Ice Arena at Key Arena? Oh. <laughs> is, is that what, is that what's next? No, no. You, you saw what T Mobile went for, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I did. That's, uh, you can't uh, you can't spin that up. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's next, right? Um, so I guess too, like what what are some of the challenges when, over the next? And we talked about headwinds. We talked about, but just like both from a from a Bitrix standpoint and just an industry standpoint, even potentially both blockchain and and cryptocurrency involvement in sports, like. How do you see the challenges across all of them kind of playing out? Uh, I mean, they're, I mean, they're different. I mean, for Bitrix, it's really about continuing to grow, continuing to adapt, and to, and to pivot where necessary. Like yeah. you guys, the 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 system moves so fast. You've got to keep up with this one way or another. As as an industry, it's all about adoption and and getting regulatory clarity. If we understand what we can do, we being an industry, then people can develop and innovate in that space. If we keep stifling innovation, it's just going to go, you know, to offshore to other companies, you know, other countries. Yeah. What's the biggest takeaway from the last few years in terms of learning, both professionally and personally? That's a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> Probably a lot. There, there is. That's that's one kind of what's the biggest one. I mean, yeah. I think one. Of the, what are some of the few? I guess that works too. Yeah. Um. I I think at, at a personal level, it's like. Keeping the eye on the ball is super important. Yeah. Um, and that, that, I, I, I'll tell any entrepreneur or anyone who wants their business, I'll tell you that. And I yeah. mean, know where you're going, know how to get there, and make sure your team is on the same page with you. Um, from from an industry perspective, I don't know. I've got one there, man. <laughs> um, what for you has been the most fun about all of this? Working with great people. I mean, like, don't get me wrong, the, the co founders yell at each other all the time. <laughs> But I wouldn't like we wouldn't have decided to work together. We didn't have the utmost respect for each other, as as people and as as technologists and engineers. Yeah. So working on a small team, you know, now a much bigger team is fantastic. Running, controlling your own destiny is fantastic. Yeah. Was there any point that you felt like you weren't going to be able to control your own destiny? I'm sure there was probably plenty of ups and downs, but you know, Not obviously really. you guys have been in the industry for quite some time. Yeah. It wasn't like you were fresh out of school or anything like yeah. that. There was a point in, in 2016, 2017 where I almost went to work for Apple because my, my old VP went there. Yeah. And you no, know, Bill. It's and, tough to turn down. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and Bill and yeah, I actually had a, I actually rented a place already. I was ready to move. Wow. And then Bill and Rami like talked me and pulled me back into Bitrix. And I'm, I'm glad I did it, obviously. I mean, yeah. like, it's been a super fun journey. Um, and like I said, we, we've hired some of the, our, like some of the people from both those companies that I thought were fantastic. Yeah. So it's really great to just work with a great team. What are some of the culture takeaways? I think that's the biggest thing that either plagues organizations or makes them run from your standpoint as someone who, like I said, has been in these organizations with culture at their heart for the most part. Mm -hmm. Key takeaways or things that you can pass on from, from your guys' learnings about just solely culture. You just gotta love your job and love what you do. I mean, everyone loves that we're in crypto. It is a great space. Um, you, you don't you don't get to go to school and learn about crypto. It's not a degree you learn. You get in there, you're forced to hack slash do whatever it takes to understand it, and then use your skill and your knowledge to go build around it. Yeah. So I mean, it, it's it's kind of like the internet back in the early days. I mean, <laughs> I don't know about you, but I quit college to start a web design company because it was really cool at the time. Yeah. So it's very similar to that. What was it like taking that learnings from quitting college and starting a web design to really not like quitting your career, but, you know, taking a step away from your basically career, projecting you towards Apple to starting another company? Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't I don't know. I mean, like it, it, Rami and Bill had a lot to do with me not taking that job, you know, yeah. like 
Uh, we all have career goals. My own make VP somewhere one day, yeah. right? Like I'm never going to do that, even though even though I'm CIO of my own company. It's, yeah, it's yeah, kind of yeah. different, you know. It's kind of yeah. like a it's a challenge. Um, but you know, the, the takeaway there is like do what you love and do what, what do what's exciting. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I've always told people, even after I quit Bitrix or we sell Bitrix or whatever, I'm going to go probably go back to Apple and try working for a couple of years for fun. <laughs> If my, if my friend's still there. <laughs> see what you can see what you can yeah. you spin up. Yeah. Uh, speaking of, of spinning up, what kind of innovations would you like to see made both personally and, and, and professionally uh, in the next, you know, 6, 12, 18 months? What does that sprint look like for you? Oh, man. Um, All the tough questions. Yeah. <laughs> no, pers- personally, is I would like to – like my, my role at the company is CIO and I and one of the biggest jobs that, of that is managing the cryptocurrency wallets. Yeah. You know, like – and that, that's the hardest part, right? Like my my team, you know, the team that runs it, it's not my team, the team that runs it um, has a lot of work to keep up with it. It's my job to make sure I keep mentoring them, keep giving them the tools that they need that, so they can do it solo and I can step back a little bit more. Um, my development in the next you know, 12, 18 months is I like to get out of the day-to-day more and and, and, and be more uh, at a board level, yeah. right? Like Bitrix has a lot of pieces going to it. Um, I'm not sure I can talk about a lot of it, but <laughs> there's a lot of pieces outside of the platform. Even yeah. right? like, like, I'll give you an example. Like we're look, we're looking at an opportunity to go, you know, invest in a Bitcoin mining farm. Yeah, like getting involved in boards across different technologies places is kind of what my personal goal would be. Got it. Change a little bit than being a VP at some place. Yeah, right? exactly. <laughs> um, what from and this is more of like overarching standpoint from not even just like an innovative standpoint, but from an industry standpoint. Obviously, as a sports fan, what can some of these sports teams just learn from like the crypto industry? Not you know from a sponsorship standpoint, from just an overall general execution and delivery. Um, what can they learn? I think, I think one thing they can learn is that don't be afraid of crypto space. I mean, yeah. Russell Cook wants to get paid in Bitcoin. Yeah, pay the man Bitcoin. See how see how it goes. I mean, yeah. there's other opportunities there. Um, I can understand how that's not their core function or, or their core their core business, and you know. People get sometimes they are uncomfortable outside of that space. Yeah. So get familiar. Be uncomfortable. How would you say? How would you, you know, turn them or point them to getting familiar? What's uh, you know, obviously you just said you can't learn crypto, right? Yeah. You probably spent a you know, few years behind the scenes learning it. How, how would you get familiar? How would you get educated? Uh, I think there's a lot of resources today on the internet. I mean, yeah. it's simple Google searches, you know, how tos. I mean, even our own site, Bitrix, has a couple of videos on YouTube that explains sort of the basics of it. Yeah. Um, it's just it's just it's a desire to go learn yeah. and curiosity. Would you change anything over the last six years? Yes. <laughs> what would you change? Um, you know, we've done a great, great job growing this company, but you know, we've we've made mistakes just like everyone else. Yeah. I mean, if hindsight, you know, we had perfect hindsight. Like some of the things we would have done earlier was establish a better KYC ML program. Um, when we first started in 2013, like I said, there were no rules. You could sign up with an email address, and that was it. How is those mistakes or those learnings change what you guys are doing now? Um, we have a lot better people think about the problem. Yeah. I mean, like I said, it was run by four people for, for the first two, three years. We didn't have the the knowledge or the expertise or the vision to even anticipate those things. Today, we're surrounded by a great organization with, with lots of experience. I mean, our compliance officer used to work at DHS. Yeah. So it's just like, People that have been in sort of like the know are, are looking at what we're doing and giving us the proper advice so we can uh, make the right decisions going forward. So it's the old adage of surrounding people or surrounding yourself with people who are smarter than you. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. And the thing is, we knew we weren't that smart. We were just engineers, <laughs> but we thought we were doing the right thing, right? Yeah. And then when you start bringing the really smart people and you sort of realize there's some things we, a lot of things we could fix. Yeah. And there was, there's some, I would just like, I would mean, probably say there's like some personal battles when you're going through this process, the four of you and then going through and fighting the fact that like you didn't know everything but you're trying to build something that's entirely brand new yeah it's probably not not the easiest definitely not the easiest but we got through it <laughs> and here you are right here we are today and here exactly. you are juicing after a, a oh man yeah <laughs> <laughs> juicing and eating almonds right it is terrible yeah so well i mean as as you look back and forward to right a little bit of reflection and a little bit of foresight you know what was the evolution or how has the evolution of crypto kind of like changed the overall, I would say not like industry, but like the space and just general, right? When you guys started, it was a lot more immature than it is now, even though you still classify it as, as immature. Um, it's really gone from enthusiasts and technologists and libertarian type 
you know, environment to something that's that's more regulated and structured. I mean, <clears throat> you see, you, you see, sort of what happened in the beginning. You had computer scientists mining Bitcoin, you know, you know cyberpunks trading it. It was it was just a it was a a uh, unknown arena. I mean, but today you've got to, you've got all these you've got to watch every step you make. Yeah, which is why like all these new blockchains are being developed. They're actually working with regulatory bodies to make sure that they're within bounds. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying that's a good or bad thing. There's an entire sector of people who want to be off the grid, who believe that anonymity is important. They want to be able to trade t- currency. I mean, you have people that want to hoard gold. It's the exact same thing. Yeah. Um, but you can't have that, and you can't have that sort of freedom and anonymity and still, you know, operate within certain federal, you know, laws and regulations. Yeah. How did you how did you stumble upon this when you first started? <clears throat> You Google's <laughs> Google. No, searches. I think it's a Wired magazine. So oh, really? yeah, I think it was. I think it was a Wired magazine in 2011. So Bill and I would, you know, you, you used to be able to mine Bitcoin. So Bill and I would go on Craigslist and meet people in parking lots and buy graphics cards in the middle of the night, right? <laughs> and then we'd plug them in our computer, and then you know we back then we were mining like a Bitcoin a day, yeah, right? And you know Bill used to take that and turn around and sell it on eBay, and we're like, woohoo! I mean. <laughs> I mean, if Bill ever tells you the story, he'll tell you how he how he deleted his hard drive with like twenty bitcoins on it too. Oh, jeez. Yeah, because like Bitcoin went from twenty five dollars to three dollars. So we're like, oh, it's dead now. Let's move on with life. You yeah. Know? And then you know, twenty thirteen came around. Bitcoin six hundred dollars. So we're like, we're like WTF? Damn. Let's go do something. <laughs> I wish we had that twenty yeah. Bitcoin hard drive now. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that's the funny thing about Bitcoin with us is like, we always wanted some, and it, doesn't, it wasn't a matter of. Uh, it was a matter of how, how do we get some, you know, we can mine it and that started getting painful. So we, let's go build a business. Let's sell Amazon gift cards for Bitcoin to cut. So we earned a little bit there. And then when that got to a point where like, let's build an exchange, we take a little cut there. So it's just, we want to acquire Bitcoins. We think it's important. I mean, it, it's, I don't want to make it blown up proportion, but it's, like it's, it's an important event in, in human history. You know, it's like yeah. internet being invented. I think Bitcoin being invented is, is a big deal. So this wasn't your first rodeo. <laughs> no, <laughs> there's no. a few a few darker alleys behind there. Abs- the... Absolutely, like I'm kind of a serial entrepreneur, even though yeah. most of them failed. But <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. So even in, like in baseball, right, the, the superstars and the all stars fail seven times out of ten, right? Mm-hmm. So I would say one time out of ten as an entrepreneur is not. Uh, you're still you're still in a good spot. Those are good stats with entrepreneurs. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And and you you talked about Bitcoin and crypto and blockchain mm-hmm. being this moment in time for both probably your industry, all industries, the future of realistically humankind too. Mm -hmm. What do you kind of see the transformational effect being of all of this coming to a head now and continuing to grow? Um, If I could predict that, I'd- I'd, You wouldn't be here? I'd be in Vegas (laughs) filling that 16 car part layout. (laughs) No, I mean, I mean, who- who could have predicted the internet would have done what it did in you know, when back in 1980 or whatever, when it first came out? Yeah. Um, I, I can't tell you what it's going to look like. I can't tell you that the blockchain technology is trans- transformative. Um, it's going to be part of our existence you now for a very long time in some shape or form. Yeah. Um, yeah. Why do you think now is when the point when blockchain became this this transformative? What was like the 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 soup or the magic potion or everything that kind of came to a head that made it like this time would be the right time was it people like you who were coming from different areas was it just the fact that like it had become a little bit more mature um i think it was going to get there regardless of who was there i mean satoshi dropped this thing into what 20, 2000, 2009 2010 yeah um it took time to grow and then the technology itself is a great achievement outside of bitcoin right i think you know, the Bitcoin aspect of it is you a lot of people that were just, you know, interested in, in the in the in the security in the you know, cryptos of it, the cryptocurrency aspect of it. Yeah. So the more people use it, the more it grew. And anytime something grows big enough, some institutional players are gonna come in, government's gonna come in, it's gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, bigger it grows and more eyes are on it. Exactly. So it's not a matter it's not a matter of like what caused it. There's no catalyst, I think. It's just it's just evolution. Yeah. Same thing with the internet. No, nothing. There's no. Okay, that's not true. Is that the World Wide Web was a, it was a killer app on it? But like, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it, it, the the internet would have blown up regardless of, of you know whether whether the web came to life or not. Yeah. What's it's been just, the proudest moment so far? If you can put on one or proudest moments. Wow. Growing the company to 100 people. Yeah. I mean that that's that's a lot of work, especially in a, in a two year time frame. Your P and Ls probably look a little bit different now than they did when it, you were four full time. It does. 
<laughs> but, uh, <laughs> we, we gotta keep working on that. that yeah. That's fine. I yeah. mean, um, it's important to have the engineers to be able to build build the systems that need to be built. Yeah. So, what does the next year for you guys look like? Is it strategic investments? Is it so you, without sharing too much or whatever it is that you can? Is it acquisitions? You know, how do you kind of see it shaking out? Like, what is it that you guys need to succeed for the next five years? Done in the next year? It's it's building platform. Yeah. I mean, honestly, like. I don't know how much you follow financial news, but uh, Robinhood, yep. you know, went to zero zero percent trading fees, right? And then shortly after that, I think Goldman's or Morgan yep. Stanley, one of them followed, right? There's kind of this, um, there's this, this kind of like mind shift away from uh, trading fees. It's, it's getting commoditized a little bit, right? The goal here now is basically, you know, acquire funds that can be used and reinvested, blah blah blah. So I think I think the future of Bitrix is building a platform where people want to come and you know put their funds here. You know, build applications, build really cool things. And then for us, it's we're able to, you know, make money off money that's there. <laughs> it's never a bad thing, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Making money off money that's there. It's uh, it's pretty good, like, theory for life, honestly. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously, this isn't your only thing. You're a serial entrepreneur. What If you weren't doing this, what else would you be doing? Selling chicken sandwiches? Uh, owning open, sports teams? Owning sports teams would be great. Yeah. <laughs> no one for sale? No. no. I know well. a few. <laughs> What would I be doing? No, I, honestly, I'd I'd, uh, I'd I'd want to go just be a VC somewhere. I mean, um, and not in the block, not just in the blockchain space. I mean, I've I've kind of, I, I'm I'm getting, I'm always bombarded by stuff in the blockchain space. So I would like to sort of look, like diversify a bit, uh, invest in some other things. You know, my friend has a juice shop. I think it's cool. Not where this came from. <laughs> not, 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 not where not this came from. Are. But <laughs> nice plug. Yeah. Um, what what from a VC standpoint? If you put your VC hat on, like, what's most interesting? What do you get excited about? Where what, what are you buying? What are you selling in terms of like what's going on right now? Um, I like things that change people's lives. Like you see, you hear a lot of things about like AI and like machine learning. Like that stuff's always gonna be great. But like simpler things, and I, I don't have an example. But yeah. you know, there's. I love Shark Tank. I'm not gonna lie, right? Like, <laughs> which shark would you be if you were on Shark oh, Tank? Are, are you are you Barbara? Are you Mr. Wonderful? I'd be Mr. Wonderful. Okay, so you're gonna cut a. You want a license fee? I want a license fee. I want I want it in perpetuity. There yeah, you I go. Know. For sure. I want the loan paid back me first. Yeah, <laughs> like I, I like investing in ideas and people. Yeah, and uh, you know, it's, and that's the thing. It's not always ideas; it's people too, right? Yeah. Like you see some people that they're just really passionate about their space. They really understand it. And they love it. Like that's the stuff I love seeing. What's the what's the pitch to you if I'm if I'm someone looking for an investment like what's going to what's going to get your attention? Uh, Not that I'm looking for an investment. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, if I was if you were if I was, yeah, or whoever is my I don't know. Tell me your hook is like what's special and uh like what makes it unique? Yeah. How and, what, it, and why do people want it? How long did it take you guys to figure that out from your own company standpoint? For Bitrix? Yeah. Um, are you still figuring it out? <laughs> I'm still figuring it out. I yeah. mean, I, there's a lot of talk back in the day like, you know, if we build this, why us, right? And and the answer was, you know what? We have better technology. We have better backgrounds. We've done this before at bigger scales, you know? Um, I mean, seriously, 2013, the biggest exchanges, people didn't even know who ran them. They had no names or faces behind it. And when we launched, the first thing I did was throw up all three of our faces and our resumes and our LinkedIn profiles. Like, like, we're real people. We're in the United States. You know, these Fortune 50 companies trust us with our security of the entire companies. Yeah. Um, you can trust us with, you know, whatever your, your money or your crypto. Do you think that was almost like a, I wouldn't say like a winning point, but almost like something that fundamentally probably shot you guys a little bit more forward because of the fact that people actually knew who you were or you at least let them know who you were? I, I think so. But at the same time, these are the same people that wouldn't trust anything they read online anyways and they didn't think we were real. So <laughs> I don't know how much it actually garnered us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But like today, everyone knows who we are and, you know, what our backgrounds are like and, you talked about people and, and hiring the right people, and you've mentioned culture and team. From a people standpoint, what is it that you guys look for? And this is just, I think, a good overall learning in terms of what can be successful in high-growth startups, what can just be successful internally. What you look for is probably different than what a sports team looks for, but at the end of the day, all of it's governed by people. So yeah. what are the people, at least, that you found in your ecosystem that have succeeded the, the, the most? Smart, passionate people. I mean, it really comes to smart and passion. I mean... Working hard gets you a lot of places. Working smart gets you everywhere. Um, so that's that's kind of always been my mantra. It's like always work smarter. Um, my boss has always told me you should be only working about sixty percent of the time. All right, forty percent you should be figuring out how to get out of what, what you're doing. <laughs> so uh, I've, I've taken that to heart, and you know, I believe people that are always looking for better ways of doing things is, is kind of who you want your team. Yeah. 
how does the 60 40 look on the leadership team for you guys uh, who's who's the one trying to like figure out how to get out of what they're I doing i think we all are yeah. but um you know we're probably we're probably all working 140% trying to do 100% <laughs> and trying to figure out how to get out of what we're doing yeah uh, <clears throat> and you touched on some advice there what what's something that stuck with you throughout this process that you've kind of like leaned on whether it's something that your other co-founders and partners have told you or that you've gleaned from other bosses vps other places um <laughs> the one piece of advice I've always followed that I don't think I should have followed anymore is, is that it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission. <laughs> Sounds about right for, for, for where you guys are. Yeah, in, in most of my career, I've, I've used that advice soundly. In this one, we may have erred on the side <laughs> too far on the, on, the, on the bad side of that yeah. equation. Um, but other than that, it's just, you know, trust your customers, right? Be obsessed with what they're doing. And this is this is an Amazon thing that, yeah. that, that's followed around. It's like, if you, if you throw your customers, then... Things will all be work out for the best. Yeah. What is what are the customers of Bitrix told you guys along the way? Hmm. Hopefully, nice things. <laughs> you know what? It, there have been streaks of really nice things and streak of really horrible things. And yeah. um, what did yeah. you guys learn the most from horrible things? All right, or both? Uh, a lot of the horrible things were dictated by things we had to go do to keep ourselves protected. Yeah. And there's just there, there's just no way around that, right? Like you have to, like I said, we've always wanted to operate on on the right side of the law. You know be white hats in the space. So we may have done some really bad things to customers, but we did it to operate in that white in that space. Um, the learning there is that we should have gotten ahead of it. That's our that's our fault for not being not not foreseeing where, where things were going. You know? And the and the good feedback is always just great to hear. Yeah. You know? Was it tough to have those conversations with the the customers at the time? I'm oh, assuming yeah. it was probably earlier on. So. It was earlier on. You know what? They they still spam my Twitter feed sometimes. <laughs> so uh, they still exist out there and I and I apologize to them all. Yeah. Do you think you, you you gain any of them back at some point or no? I would like to think, I would like to think so. Yeah. I mean, we're working on solving some uh, we're working on solving a lot of problems that cause customer pain. Yeah, and we're always trying to think of you know ways to make things better for our customers. So yeah. hopefully we'll get them all back. <laughs> well, if you could get rid of one problem that you guys are facing, what would it, what would it be? The biggest one. I am not answering that question. <laughs> I have the answer. I'll tell you offline. <laughs> yeah, I feel you. I feel you. The smaller problems. What are some of the smaller, smaller problems? problems? Yeah. Um, smaller problems. Being hired, being able to hire fast enough. Yeah. You now we've talked about culture. Yeah. It's like you hire an engineer, it's going to take them three, six months to ramp up. It just takes time to get keep people coming in and, and uh, doing great work. Do you think there's anything that can change that as someone who's trying to likes people who can optimize situations? <sighs> Everyone thinks they can change it, but, you know, given the, the laws of average of numbers, it just, that's just the way it is. Yeah. And there's, they're growing pains of every company. And, yeah. uh, you know, all we can do is rely on our leadership team. To continue to, to grow the company quickly and, and efficiently. Was there any hiring horror stories? <laughs> Probably a few along the way. Yeah, but I wouldn't. I can't tell them though. <laughs> <laughs> any learnings, I guess, from hiring like, that you've changed early on that you may have implemented now in terms of growing the culture. Probation periods are great. That's what I've learned. <laughs> Describe that. Uh, you give some. You give some basically a thirty day probationary period that you can you can both walk away from happily, and not not deal with any issues. Yeah. I mean, a lot, a lot of bigger companies have that actually, but really? you know, as a small company, you don't think about that. You're just trying to get bodies in. So. Yeah, and it changed to you. was did it change the talent level or just change the fact that like, hey, look, we're not going to know if this works out for a month, and if it doesn't work out for a month, then you know we're both good and let's just keep moving. It, it, it goes to the to the to the adage of like hire fast, fire faster, right? So if you're if you have the ability to hire fast, that's great as long as you have the ability to fire faster if it's not working out. There's yeah. no like the entire concept of comp some companies going, oh, it's not working out. You go on a three month pip with a six month review. It's just it doesn't cut it for a small smart startup. Yeah, then it's nine months later. And yeah, it's the same person is there, or it's just not working for anyone at that exactly. time. Exactly. So now you're five years in, five almost six. Um, what do the next five years look like if you could write them in in your head? We become the AWS of the entire blockchain space. Everything great that's happening is built on top of our platform. And I sit on the board smiling and <laughs> smiling <laughs> and owning direction. a sports team and juice cleansing, yes. right? Yes. What takes what's it take to get there besides great people? Oh. Execution. Like we know what we have to do. And uh, um, you know, it, it, execution speeds vary as organizations get larger and, yeah. and, and different sizes. So being able to execute and stay on the same and stay on course of the vision um is probably the most important thing. Do you think there's a there's a bubble around crypto and blockchain right now, and that there's something that could imp eventually impact it, or or no? I can't can't yeah. say one way or another on that one. Yeah, 
Hopefully not, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> For everything in general. All right, and uh, I guess to finish up, what uh, what you talked about teams and owning sports teams. <laughs> if you could own a sports team, oh. no tampering. We're not tampering. What uh, what sports team would you would you like to own, or where would you like to be in a league? I know you mentioned the bringing the the Sonics back. I don't want to own the Seahawks. Seahawks. I'd like a piece of the Seahawks. Jody has all of it right now. She can spare a little bit. I don't mind. <laughs> you can you can you can um, wrap it into the sponsorship. Well, agreement. exactly. Well, mm-hmm. you saw you saw how Macklemore and Russell Wilson got a piece of the Sounders yeah. this past. No, I wouldn't mind got a piece of that either. <laughs> Seattle based. Oh uh. uh, yeah, Seattle based. I mean, uh, I'm ba- like I, I so I was born in New York. Yeah. Um, and I grew up in Orlando, Florida. I don't have a lot of options for sports teams that I like. I mean, I like the Dolphins, but I would never. <laughs> <laughs> that's that yeah yeah, yeah. Um, but I've been in Seattle since 97 yeah. so this is my home now uh, my wife's family his family's from here yeah. so definitely Seattle based you're a you're a UCF grad how did you feel about the UCF football team the last few years are so, they national champions so I didn't graduate I, I quit quit, right? quit quit sorry sorry UCF <laughs> I would like to say I graded yeah um, you know what I I think UCF should have gotten a shot at national championship yeah. just like you no know, Boise State should have gotten it you know, back when during their run yeah 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 like they both had really great runs. Yeah. So, is there a shot you ever go back and graduate, or is it? You know, I thought about doing that. Really? I failed calc three times. I always <laughs> want to go back and pass calc, so I can just skip just passing calc. Maybe enough. That's funny. <laughs> you you, you failed calc, and here you are, right? <laughs> Looking back, it probably would. If you passed calc, do you think things would have been differently? No, I'll still be here. Still, still be here. Yeah. Awesome. Calc was one of many classes that I failed. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. You took that into parlayed it into something else. Exactly. Right? Awesome.